right. Some of you like high five 10 people. Come on now. You got to save some of those high fives for a little bit later. After the service and Pastor Kurt, when he comes up at the end of our time together today, uh, he'll mention this, but just so it's in your mind, kind of percolating, you may have noticed as you came in, different stations set up in our pat- on our patio, and, in- and as you walked into the gallery going, what's that all about? I see like awesome like jams and like preservatives and like stuff that's grown from the ground that looks like it would be awesome in my being, and then I'm also seeing like uh, a grill out there. Yes, there will be a hot dog fundraiser. We have baked goods fundraiser. We have a cookie dough bar. If you've got bottles and cans, there's a station out there. We're raising funds to send our students to Orlando. And know this, not everyone can go to Orlando, Florida, July the 30th when National Fine Arts kicks off, but your, your passion, your prayer, your investment financially can, and God will use it. He'll use it, and you'll, I think at the end of time one day, whenever, when I say the end of time, whenever we stand before God in heaven, we'll, we'll, our minds will be blown at how he's used, like what you did today at the end of the service, July the 7th, to invest in a student and how that changed the whole trajectory of their life, their family tree going forward. You have that ability just by making a purchase to raise funds. So that, we'll mention that one more time before you leave, but that's what's going on out there. What? Uh, we're going to do today is talk about a message uh, called the call to obedience. Man, it seems like every time I get a chance to share on a Sunday, I'm doing something about obedience. Maybe God's trying to speak to me. Okay. Uh, oh, I get it, God. I, I get it because when pastors tend to share messages, it's about what God's doing in their own life. And you're going to hear in just a few moments from one of our fine art students who her message qualified, I'll introduce her in a second, qualified for National Fine Arts in the short sermon category. And the name of our message today, The Call to Obedience, is based on what she shared. You're going to be blessed by it. But just to give you a little bit more of an inside take, on March the 8th, we had the amazing opportunity to take 28 students, families, leaders from Bridgewood Church to Mount Morris. Everyone know where Mount Morris is at? You've heard of it? For people like me, not from Michigan, I was like, where's Mount Morris? Is that, is that like a mountain? No, it's just a town, city, not too far from here. And we went to the church there. And let me tell you, I've been doing youth ministry for, man, probably about too long, 20 years, right? I'm aging myself. And that, I hate to call it just an event, because an event sometimes has uh, kind of a, a connotation. But that experience that we did that weekend was one of the hallmark experiences that I've ever taken part of in youth ministry, growing up in youth ministry or being a leader, a youth pastor. It was moving. It was riveting. We had such a great cheering section of of fans, if you will, from Bridgewood Church leaders that every room that our students performed in, the, the people patrolling the door because everything has got guidelines from times that you can get into the room to watch a performance, and there's just oodles and just tons of performances going on, so you have to hit your time. From the times that you enter, you have a certain amount of time, and then they only have a window of time to deliver their performance. The people patrolling the doors are like, oh, my gosh, this church really loves their students. This church is, like, attending in, like, rampant fashion. I mean, I'm not making this up. In one particular uh, situation, the dude, like, shut the door because we had too many Bridgewood church people there to watch it. And we had to go up and ask him. We got a few more outside. They're, like, kind of like the parents of the kids performing. So if you could let them in, that'd be awesome. But we, it was just that kind of situation for us. And when you have a fine arts team at the standard of Bridgewood Church, that doesn't happen by accident. I am so honored to be here. I came on the scene in November of 2018, became the next gym pastor here. And when I got here, fine arts was revved up. It was going strong. And right now, I just want to give, and you're seeing our group right there at the districts behind me, but I want to give two people a special, special recognition for the sacrifice, the time, the energies, the expertise, the administrative just uh, skills that it takes to run something of this magnitude. Erica and Anthony Giordano, can we give them a huge, they're back there. They are, Erica's our fine arts director. Anthony does yeoman's work beside her. 
And I'm going to ask Erica. She'll, no, I'm just kidding, Erica. This is a total joke. Would never do that to you. Um, I'll lose my fine arts director, and I don't want to do that. So, yeah, just messing. I like to joke. That's just a youth pastor being a youth pastor. But anyways, uh, what they've done and then the preparation and going to nationals has just been phenomenal. I sit back, and I thank the Lord all the time for the resources we have here at Bridgewood Church. So now I'm going to turn this podium over for a little bit to their daughter, Ellie Giordano. Ellie, yeah, Ellie, come on out. I, I hate to be biased. I love music, and Pastor Caleb and Michaela do a phenomenal job working with all of our musicians, but this is my favorite category only because I'm a pastor, and this is like what I do. Okay, I'm being a little biased. I love them all. They're like my kids. But Ellie doing the short sermon, I got to watch it uh, in practice, got to watch you do it at districts, and now she's going to perform it here before she goes to nationals. So sit back. Can we all buckle up? Maybe take your invisible seatbelt, click it. Ellie's getting ready to take the stage. Hey, good morning, Bridgewood. My name is Ellie Giordano, as you heard, um, and I am going into 11th grade at Clarkston High School. So last year at school, I took a class called Leadership, which is basically student council. And at Clarkston, Leadership has that click of popular kids. How many of you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I had only been going to school there for one year, and so I was kind of hoping that this class was going to be a chance for me to become friends with these kids. Basically, I was super careful not to mess this up. Well, one day in leadership, we were watching a TED Talk, and all of a sudden, this girl passed out. Within seconds, the teacher had turned the lights on, and students were crowded around her, trying to revive her, and I heard God whisper, pray for her. You know when God says something really clearly, and you just wish he hadn't said it so clearly? <sighs> it was that kind of moment. I started questioning God, and he proved that it was him talking, and I was like, God, do you even see who I'm around right now? They're going to think I'm so weird, and he was like, Ellie, go pray for her, and I was like, God, stop it. <laughs> well, I had that internal argument for what felt like hours. Haven't you been there? We are so quick to judge the things God asks us to do. Oftentimes, when God speaks to us, our initial reaction is to question our ability. We respond to God's call based on our surroundings and evaluate our capability within seconds, concluding with, God, what are you thinking? I can't do that. Or we try on our own. We attempt to muster up enough human strength to accomplish what God has asked us to do, and we come up short every time. So we respond with, well, God, that one's on you for asking me to do something impossible. But God does not call us to things we are not capable of. He calls us to that which we are only capable of through him. This brings me to the story of Gideon. Judges chapter 6, starting in verse 11, introduces us to Gideon, someone very relatable. God told Gideon that he would save all of Israel out of the hands of the Midianites. And Gideon basically says, um, God, don't know if you've looked around lately, but the Midianites have complete control over us, and me and my family are not very special. Sometimes we can feel like that too, can't we? But verse 16 says, the Lord answered, I will be with you and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. God does not expect us to do what he calls us to on our own. In fact, just the opposite. He calls us to that which is only possible with him, so we have to rely on his strength. Like Gideon, God doesn't just give us a command and then leave us. He reassuringly says, I will be with you. It is through my power that you will do this. The reason God wants us to trust him in obedience 
is because he knows that we can never experience the fullness of his presence until we learn to obey. God is a God of relationship, and obedience is his love language. Psalm 51.6 says, Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Since the very moment he thought us into existence, God has called us to obedience, knowing it would draw us near to him. We serve a God who loves us, don't we? As always, God has created a perfect system. In furthering his kingdom by calling us to the impossible, God is really inviting us to a place of intimacy with him we would never know otherwise. James 4, 5 says that God jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us. God designed us with a spirit that wants more of him naturally. Why wouldn't we obey? So, remember my story from earlier about my leadership class? You probably didn't forget. I didn't do it. I did not pray for the girl who passed out. Our teacher told us to go in a different room, and I just started praying in my head. I questioned my own ability rather than depending on God's, and in that later opened up opportunities for the devil to reach me in a vulnerable place of shame. Don't miss the call to obedience. Surrender your everything to God. Allow him to provide the strength for your steps of faith. And when you do, get ready to experience his presence like never before. Thank you. Unbelievable. That'll preach, won't it? That'll totally preach. We could do an altar call right now, but we want to extend that theme of call to obedience. Ellie will be sharing that same message Uh, at nationals, and I cannot wait to hear it there. You know, I just recently uh, was able to become a dog owner. Any dog owners in the house? Come on, let me hear you. Yeah. Sorry, cat owners. Nothing personal. I'm just a dog owner. Aw, I just offended like a third or fourth, hopefully no more than that. Okay, good. Um, I love you guys. So, Here's the deal. You, you will recognize this. This right here, I think. This right here is something that is becoming very... Pre- Don't worry, it's not used. It's new, okay? This right here, I'll get the mic up on me, is a potty pad. Can I say that on the stage of church on a Sunday morning? Potty pad right here um, that we are teaching our puppy that you're seeing right there. Her name is Remy to use, Okay. So our hardwood floors and carpets can stay in pristine condition. Well, I like to refer to this as an obedience pad, all right? That's what it really is. We're training her to be obedient. And it's going pretty well last night. Three straight shots right here. Thank you, Jesus. The prayers are working. We put her on the prayer list. And lo and behold, God loves pets. All dogs go to heaven, right? And these right here are little treats that Remy gets when she does her trick on the pee, on the pee pad, potty pad, sorry, obedience pad. There we go. That's more holy, the obedience pad, all right? Can I tell you that we all in our life kind of can relate to Remy? I'm going to put this right here for now. We can all relate to Remy or your dog in training because I can relate to the fact that obedience, the way Ellie just spoke of, The way Gideon dealt with in the book of Judges is not a one-time deal. Obedience is a lifestyle when done correctly. It's not just something like Simon says, like, okay, God, what are you telling me to do? And then I'll do it. It's it's really, it shapes who you are, what you're about, your, your, your relationship with God. And I really look at obedience in the same vein that Ellie shared, it is God's love language. Has any one of you read, and I have a feeling I'm going to see hands, you know where I'm going, The Five Love Languages by Dr. Gary Chapman. All the married men, if you haven't read it, just raise your hand. Your wife will really, really like that, okay? You just have to exercise and execute it after that. But The Five Love Languages by 
Dr. Chapman deal with five areas that your relationship in marriage, but I branch it out to your relationship with friends, your relationships with others, your relationships in the workforce, if you are on a team, your coaching relationships, all of those things, okay, uh, those relationships hinge upon relating to someone's love language. And when we are obeying God, we are dealing with his love language. You know, in the book, The Five Love Languages, words of affirmation. You don't have to amen or woohoo, but some of you right now are shaking your head like, I need words of affirmation. If I don't get that from those closest to me, I feel a little incomplete. That's one of the love languages. Another one is quality time. I can tell you I'm a quality time kind of guy. I love quality time. I I need it. My wife is away on a work trip right now, and so I'm kind of missing that, so it's great to be up here with the youth students right here. They are my quality time fillers. I enjoy that. Receiving gifts. Now, come on now. Everyone's into the receiving gifts love language, right? But some of you, it's not really about the money or not really about how much it costs per se, but just the notion of getting something that's meant just for you. Then with the fourth love language is acts of service, okay? So men, we all hear this, right? Honey, can you vacuum the floor? Can you... Take the dishes out of the dishwasher. Um, I don't know. Can you do this, Aaron? Do this honey-do list item. Uh, Acts of service is one that is big and really helps the marriage. And then physical touch, okay? And I'm a youth pastor, so as soon as I say physical touch, sometimes it's easy to think of just one area. But physical touch can just be, you know, uh, holding hands. It could just be uh, placing a hand on a shoulder of someone, reassuring them. You get what I'm saying? That, hey, it's going to be all right. I'm in this with you. I love you. You know, all those five love languages, somewhere along the way, one of them resonated with you. You may have two of them that you need to have in your life in order to be complete in your relationship. Do you know there's a God in heaven? Because he made us in his image, did he not? And so if he made us in his image, he also has a need for a love language. And you can fulfill that need. The question is, are you executing it the way Gideon had to learn, the way Ellie dealt with? I've been right where Ellie's been at, where God's asked you to do something. He's asked you to obey him, and it's not easy. It's never really easy when God is throwing out a test to you. Obedience is his love language. We encounter his powerful presence and understand the plans he has for us when we obey him. We understand the plans he has for us when we obey him. You know, it says in Judges chapter 6, verse 16, and Ellie just read that, and I want to read it again. Remember the Lord answered Gideon when he says, me, I'm the one who you're choosing to take down the Midianites? It goes like this, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Ellie set it up perfectly, but have you ever been challenged by God to do something in your world? And your response is you got the wrong dude, God. I'm not the person that, that, I can't do that. Has he ever challenged you to maybe take part in a ministry at Bridgewood Church, whether that's parking ministry, whether that's teaching, whether that's ushering, working in the media booth, and you're like, nah, I, I just don't have time. I, I probably mess it up. Or maybe he's challenged you to go on a mission trip or challenged you to support something. Maybe you can't go, but to support someone going, whether it be fine arts, supporting. And by the way, when they go to Fine Arts Festival, they're not just performing. They have services every night, the National uh, Youth Convention that takes place where students from all over the country descend upon that. So there is ministry that our students are getting. And maybe God is challenging you to support that. Or maybe you've been challenged in where you work to share the love of God. We have a, we have a, a kind of a motto in Bridgewood Youth, and it goes like this. Always be willing to share the love of God with people, and if needed, use words. If needed, use words. Because sometimes we kind of think, okay, if I can just memorize this statement, or memor- and I'm all about Scripture. You need to have it on your lips. You need to be prepared in season and out of season to deliver a verse of Scripture. But your life is walking Scripture if you're living it the way God wants you and intends for you to live it. He, you, people see something different in you. They do. They see something that maybe they don't see in other people. You know, one of the things that I can tell you is that in my life, God has challenged me so many times 
to take a stand, to do something that was out of the ordinary. And there's been times I've said, no, God, I can't do it. But the times I do say, yes, God, I want to be obedient to your will, I encounter him in ways that I never could have before. I encounter him in ways that, frankly, were impossible before. You know, God confirms his hand over our life as we speak his love language. God confirms his hand over our life as we speak his love language. You know, let's look at Gideon real quick. Let's just take a little, like a deeper look at Gideon. Um, when God came to him and said, I want you to defeat the Midianites. And if you did, if you haven't read Judges chapter six and seven, the Midianite army far surpassed the army of Israel. In fact, they already, they had, they kind of owned them at this point in time. The book of Judges can be a tad bit depressing to read because you're, you're going from Joshua, them taking the city, and then after Joshua dies, the, the people, the Israelites, they, they kind of lose their way with God, and they kind of disobey God, and they start worshiping other idols, the, the altar of Baal. They start doing things that God is not pleased with, so he kind of says, I, I, I can't bless you anymore. You're relinquishing my hand, a blessing. I can't give you, and I hate to go a little juvenile here, but I can't give my pet a treat if the obedience pad isn't taken care of properly. It works the same way, the exact same way in your life and in my life. We can't give or get blessings from God or experience the richness of him if we're not being obedient. That's what it takes. And you and I both know where he's asked us to do that. So Gideon played the excuse card. He went, I'm from the weakest clan in Manasseh, uh, and I'm the least in my family, God. Why me? And then God said, and what we read in Judges 6, 16, that I will be with you. Don't you love that? Have you ever gotten that promise, and that's really it, that I will be with you? He doesn't really always unveil the next step. That's your faith, where you have to take the next step with him, but I will be with you. And in this case, he said, look, I'm going to destroy all the Midianites. And then Gideon still needed to have confirmation from God. <clears throat> and so we see that Gideon actually prepared a sacrifice. And then he prepared it with not only uh, a goat, but he had a broth and he had, he had bread without yeast. And then what, what the angel of the Lord did is took the staff and touched that sacrifice and instantly fire began to come. Fire consumed it. And that meant God was pleased with the sacrifice. You see what happens? Gideon said yes to what God asked him to do, obedience. And then yes became another yes. Now I'm gonna do this. And God began to confirm, I will be with you. Sometimes God can't confirm he will be with you in the trial of obedience that maybe you're undergoing or maybe the test of obedience because you've yet to take that first step. You've yet to say yes. It could be that you've yet to say yes to a relationship with him. You're in this building. I love the fact that you're in church, but simply coming to church doesn't mean you have a relationship with Jesus, does it? It doesn't mean that. Like, I could go stand in my garage, but that doesn't mean I'm a vehicle, all right? It, 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 so just coming to church is great. We want you to come, but you can't be all God wants you to be, and you can't take church out there to the world that you live in, which is really the essence. That's why we, we do church. It's to rev you up. It's a pep rally to glorify God so you can take church to your world so we can grow the kingdom of God. I know it says in the Bible that broad is the way to destruction, but I want to minimize that broadness. I want to see that broad road shrink a little bit. I don't want to see people that I know, that I'm family and friends with, not make heaven their home because I didn't say yes to God and, be, and I wasn't obedient to him. So maybe that's where God's got you at and you just need to say yes. Gideon began to say yes. And then the cool thing was <clears throat> Gideon, once he said yes to God and once he made a sacrifice to God, then God asked him to do something a little touchy. He says, I want you to tear down the altar that your dad has built, okay, to Baal. I want you to tear that down. Man, that, you know, it's one thing to tear down your brother's altar, you know, like sibling rivalry, but your dad, I mean, that's your dad, right? Like, even though you could be a grown adult, that's still like kind of like, uh, you know, uh, doing something that isn't right, doesn't seem right. They've always had the authority over you, and yet Gideon did that. And then later in Judges chapter 6, 
God, he said, I just need one more confirmation. Again, he's staying obedient. He's on his obedience pad. And then God, he says, God, I've got a fleece. I've got a, I want to lay out a fleece to you. And if this fleece one night has dew around it, but the ground around it is dry, I know you're behind me. And God doesn't always react to fleeces like testing him, but he did in this case. Sometimes he doesn't go this far. Sometimes you have to really walk by faith and not by sight. But God came through to Gideon in that situation that night. And then Gideon reversed and said, all right, I want the fleece to be dry, God. But the next night after that happens, I want to wake up and the ground around the fleece be wet. Sure enough, it was. God says, I am with you. You just need to obey. You're appealing to my love language. The process of obedience to God is scary. It is scary. But don't stop trusting or you'll forfeit the miracle. I'm going to say it again to make sure you got that. The process of obedience to God is scary. But don't stop trusting or you'll forfeit the miracle. I can still remember the whole thought of getting married when I was in 03. I get, I get engaged. The, pro, the concept of getting married was scary to me, right? But nothing ventured, nothing gained. All of a sudden, you're committing everything to this one person that you do love, but I didn't know how that was going to go down. And I wouldn't know. And now it seems comical that I had those thoughts. Sometimes, Satan is the, not sometimes, he is the master at deceiving you that if you do God's plan, it's going to be like wicked weird, wicked awkward, and it's going to just spoil your whole life. That's just the reverse. If you'll give God's plan a chance and you'll obey God's plan and you won't step away from it, it may be scary up front, but you'll see the miracles come and then they'll come some more and then some more. And then all of a sudden you're like, I can't imagine not being obedient to God. You know, one of the things that's really been cool over the last uh, six months is I've been able to take part in the Youth Alive Club on Thursdays at Brandon High School that our own Alyssa Brandt led. And Alyssa's right there. and can see her. Can we give Alyssa a hand? I mean, let me tell you about this club. Here's a picture that you'll see. This is a club that meets after school. And Alyssa and I would text, especially on Wednesdays and Thursdays, about, <clears throat> are you going to be able to come in? I'm like, yeah, I'm going to carve this out. We're going to make this work. And it wasn't always a given how many students were going to show up. Sometimes it was a couple, sometimes a handful, sometimes a little more. And then there were times when Alyssa was like, maybe it's just going to be me and you. But you know what I loved about Alyssa? She never stopped obeying the call of God to lead the Youth Alive Club at Brandon High School. Because here's what, here's what happened. Look at, just look at that. That's just one of like a ton of pictures. We always took a, a photo at, when we met. It memorialized, not really memorialized, but it kind of celebrated. It was our monument that this day we got together, Youth Alive. We brought just the love of Christ to Brandon High School. And I, my... My dream, my vision is to have Youth Alive Clubs, Fellowship of Christian Athlete Active Clubs, uh, Young Life Active Clubs, any kind of faith club where the love of Christ is at, to have them in every high school in this area. Because that's our greatest, the schools are our greatest mission fields, y'all. I mean, the older you get, the less friends you have, okay? So when I'm in kindergarten, everyone gets a Valentine's, right? When I'm in sixth grade, about half the class, or maybe two-thirds of the class, gets a Valentine, or fifth grade. But once you get into high school, it's just a select few that might get a Valentine, all right? And now it's usually a digital Valentine on, on Instagram or Snapchat. So you see how that happens. And when you become an adult, you're like, man, do I even got a friend? You know what I mean? It's like, I'm working. I know these guys. I think they're my friends. Here's the deal. This is the time to get obedient the way Alyssa is doing to God, saying, God, I'm going to obey what you have called me to do, even if it seems a little awkward, even if it doesn't seem like I'll have a ton of students here. Let me tell you the power of going through with obedience. See, we haven't, the, this story has not been finalized yet. We don't know which student or students from this Youth Alive Club are going to be the next pastor, CEO, the next Tim Tebow, the next musician who loves Jesus that says, you know, if it wasn't for a Youth Alive Club at Brandon High School, I wouldn't have even had the opportunity to encounter Christ in a loving way. And if it wasn't for Alyssa Brandt saying, I'm going to throw down the gauntlet and lead the Youth Alive Club after Taryn Vlad did it before she graduated, those students wouldn't have a chance. 
See how that happens? Isn't that the power of God? Obedience, obedience, obedience. I'm not backing down from obedience. It's not always easy. It doesn't always feel right. It gets awkward at times. But I'd rather be awkward, cool with God than like lame, boring, and like drab, not doing God's will. And that's where you're headed. And actually, it's even worse than that. You'll be defeated. You'll be destroyed. I love what it says in the book of Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. This is, um, this is when Saul, King Saul, who was supposed to be what King David became, stopped being obedient to God. Stopped being obedient to God. And I apologize. It looks like uh, sometimes you have a, a digital issue, and, and, and a little bit of that verse is off the screen, but you'll get the, I'll, I'll read it. It says this, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord. To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of the rams. God loves obedience. He wants you to do his will, and you can only do that if you obey. See, Saul, have you ever done this, like circumvented? Like, I'm kind of being obedient, God. Like, you know, um, uh, you know, I know that you saved me and kind of delivered me from this addictive behavior, and I haven't done it in a long time, but, you know, I, you know, I kind of feel like I should go back, and maybe you have. Here's the great thing. God's forgiveness is there for you, right? But if you live in that going back, now you're not just, there, God can't forgive you if you don't mean it from the heart and if you're not willing to do the 180 the other direction, Right? Flee from sin, the Bible says. And so sometimes we start out being obedient, like Saul, but then Saul was told to kill uh, the king of the Amalekites in 1 Samuel and to destroy everything. And he decided, you know what? This would be cool. We'll just take the king captive and we'll just take some of their riches. That seemed good in his mind. And the reason that seemed good in his mind is see, oh, disobedience starts way, it starts in the heart. It starts way before you actually do the action of disobedience. And Saul was contemplating disobedience in his heart. And Samuel had to issue him this charge. Look, you can sacrifice all the stuff to God at the altar, King Saul, that you want to, but obedience is better than that sacrifice. I challenge you with that today. You know, in the same way, uh, it says in James chapter 2, verse 17, it says this, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. You may have heard it like this, faith without works is dead. And I look at that word works or action as being the obedience plan God has for your life. What is your obedience plan? What has he called you to do? You can talk about Jesus to your blue in the face about how great he is. You students, what I love about, especially our incoming sixth graders, and what I love about middle schoolers is there's an enthusiasm that they have. It boils over. In 68 class right now on Sundays, our fifth graders who just finished fifth grade this past school year have been promoted. And, man, it's like a bubbling up, man. Those kids, like, I thought I had energy. It didn't compare to a group of them. They are ready to rock and roll. And that energy is contagious, and that's what we want. But here's the deal. All the energy in the world has to be directed in the right fashion. So you students, don't miss the call this coming school year, even this summer, to be obedient to God, to say, hey, I've got friends who need to come to Bridgewood Church. They don't have a home. They don't have a church home, rather. They don't have somewhere where they can learn about God. Now's the time. Don't sit on it, you students. Don't sit on it, because delayed obedience is still disobedience. If you delay in the call of God, it's still disobedience. There's a timing. There's a window. You have to hit it. One of the things that I saw in my life, and I like to share this with our youth students, is that when God called me to leave Maryland, where I was from, to come to Michigan, it was like I had a window of time to make that decision. It wasn't just about what Pastor Kurt and the pastoral team needed, or even what Bridgewood Church needed. It was about what God wanted out of me. Now's the time. If you don't say yes to this, it doesn't mean that God can't forgive and he can't reroute you, but why get rerouted? Anyone deal with July 4th traffic this weekend like me? Yeah. 
And did you come up, you, maybe you used Waze or use the Google GPS, and did you, were, you, were you kind of like mapping it out? Did you come up on when it gets red? That's like the worst color on Google Maps. Oh, it's red, it's yellow. That means traffic's coming to a standstill. And then there's always a reroute. The reroute sometimes is a good thing, but I can tell you it's not the, the most direct shot. God's obedience plan is the most direct shot for your life. You will have a Gideon-type impact in your life as you obey the plan God has for you. You know, with Gideon, if I can jump back to that story for a second before we close, he started out with 32,000 warriors fighting for him. And God whittled it down. He said, tell them if they don't want to fight, then and their heart's not into it, then they can leave. And all of a sudden, that number went drastically down. It went drastically down, and then we see they hated one more test. And what was the other test? It was how you drink water. It was the water test. Anyone ever been involved in a test where, uh, you know, maybe, you're, maybe it's for your job, it's a physical examination, you feel like all eyes are on you? Maybe it's a test to pass school or pass a class. These men were under a test they didn't know about, and if they drank water in a way that was like a dog where they lapped it with their tongues, they were eliminated from the equation. But if they drank getting down on their knees and cupped it and brought it to their mouth, God said, keep them. 32,000 became 300. 32,000 became 300. In my mind's eye, this is where I'm starting if I'm Gideon going, God, what are you doing? Like, that don't fly. The Midianites had so many warriors, so many men, and they already had the, the, the children of Israel captive that the, the camels, forget the men, the, the book of Judges says the camels were like numbering the sand on a seashore. The camels. That's a lot of four-legged creatures. I mean, you see, in one camel, is kind of eye-popping. For me, that many camels? And yet... God said, don't worry about that. You worry about what I'm, t- focus on what I'm telling you to do. Far too often, we focus on what Satan puts up in our eyes that gets us off our course of obedience. And it's stuff like, I can't, t- I can't have a relationship with this person and lead them to Christ because you know my personality type and their personality type. They just don't fly. Or I can't afford to give to God my tithe, the way Malachi talks about, because I can't even make it on 100%. How am I going to make it on 90%? Or I can't afford to give Bridgewood Church or any other uh, giving, serving organization my time because, man, I'm too busy as it is. You see, as long as we focus on our own ability and trying to make things work, if Gideon would have said, I got 300 boys. There's no way we're even going to be able to hang. It would have never worked out. But as it was with 300 guys, they didn't even have to, like, do any major. There was no, like, bombs and, you know, bursting in the air. The way, you know what I mean? Like, the way the Revolutionary War went down. This was just with some pitchers, some torches, some trumpets. They just rout them. And they routed them so bad, the Midianites are fleeing left and right. And there was even a dream the night before that even confirmed this was going to happen. You see the way God works? He goes before you. He goes before you, even in the presence of your enemies. And he's there, and he's waiting. He's just saying, be obedient to the call. Be obedient to what I'm calling you to. And if you do, great things are going to happen, and I'm going to get the credit. Why did he reduce the army from 32,000 to 300? So they couldn't take credit for the victory. All credit goes to God. Here's the cool thing about that. If you're anything like me, when God does good things in my life, and I shared this with our pastoral team last Sunday. We had a pastoral team get together. One of the things I struggle with, can I just get real with you, is that when God does good things in my life, it's not that I can't give credit to God, but I'm like, man, I'm not too bad. Yeah, I'm pretty talented. Like, I got some talent here. I didn't realize I was there. That's awesome, God. And it's easy for ego and pride to start working its way up, right? Man, staying humble can be hard, but you can do it when you're obedient to God. He begins to flow through you, and there's nothing like giving him all glory and honor because you know on your best of best days, 
you're not routing the Midianites that are in your world. You have to have him. He's got to be there for you. And your obedience is the trigger point to that. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, maybe you're here today on a fine arts service where we featured them and it was awesome. Our students have been obedient to the call. Let me tell you something. Being obedient to putting on what you saw today from the unconventional percussion to the worship band, to the dance team, to Ellie's sermon, that just didn't happen with the snap of a finger. They have natural talent, but they had to be obedient to practice schedules. They had to be obedient to submersing themselves in prayer. And then all of a sudden, you see what you saw today. And there's many more that we couldn't even put on stage for the sake of time, where obedience was part of the equation that, that, that really solidified their commitment to what they're getting ready to do in less than a month at Fine Arts Festival, in the national stage. But maybe in your life, you're like, obedience is something I need God to help me with. And maybe the first level of obedience right now is saying, Jesus, take over my life. I need to give you my life. I need to be obedient. I need to give my heart to you. If that's you, would you raise your hand? That's you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe you're also here and you say, I haven't got, I have a relationship with Christ, but I have not been obedient in what he's calling me to do. There's something. Maybe you've been obedient in other areas, but you know there's something eyeballing you up, and you know you can get through it with Christ but you haven't been obedient to what he's calling you to do because it's scary, man. It's awkward. It doesn't feel convenient to you. And if that's you today, say, I just need the power of God. I'm gonna gonna take that step of faith through obedience, but I need the power of God with me. If that's you today, raise your hand. If that's you today, raise your hand. Awesome. Can we do this? Can we stand real quick before Pastor Kirk comes? Can we just say, can I say a prayer of closing? Can I just get you to repeat this after me? I believe if you raise your hand for salvation, and we can all say it together, I believe God is going to do something amazingly new in your life. You're a new creation in him. But if you raised your hand also for needing to follow the plan of obedience, I want you to say this prayer with us. Can we do it for Pastor Kirk Combs? Heavenly Father, come on, say it like you mean it. Heavenly Father, I need you. I'm calling out to you today. Forgive me of my sins. Saturate me with your love. Thank you for what you did on the cross. If it wasn't for you, I would not have victory in my life. I'm going to be obedient to your calling, to your plan, as I step out in my world. In your name I pray, amen and amen. Can we give God a hand for what he's going to do?